Roger, I remember it seemed just recently that multiple universes was the most exciting, revolutionary, dramatic idea that one could think about and turn around and now it's conventional wisdom. <laughs> but, but you've not j jumped on the bus, why? Well, there are two, as far as I can make out, quite distinct reasons that people put forward for believing in multiple universes. One of them has to do with the interpretation of quantum mechanics, where you take the view that these different alternative things that might happen coexist in some way, and they're sort of sitting up next to each other, or slightly different from each other. Right. Uh, the other reason that's normally put forward in favor of multiple universes is that it's argued, there's a thing called the anthropic principle, which tells you that, uh, well, maybe the constants of nature had slightly different values, and uh, if they had slightly different values, then we wouldn't be here. Not just we, but conceivable life, so the argument goes. I have trouble with this because I don't know, you know, conceivable life, what does that mean? You can think of all sorts of... We can't think of all the possibilities <laughs> that might have occurred to produce something, conscious life of some sort, but at least if it's something like the kind of life we're familiar with, it does depend on having the amount of, right amount of carbon on the earth and conditions being right in many ways. Now some of these just depend on where we happen to be, and if we're not on this planet it would be some very distant planet. And so I remember Fred Hoyle making comments like this in his radio talks uh, a long way back when I was an undergraduate. Um, but uh, the argument is that if these numbers weren't exactly as we find them, some of them make a critical difference, then life would not be possible. So the argument goes, and how is it that we're here, you see? Well, the argument is that, well, if they were slightly different, that would be another universe which is uninhabited. In another universe where they have different values, and another one, another one, and we happen to be in that particular universe where the constants of nature have that such value that life, at least life as we know it, Which allows you exist. to avoid the question that if this is the only universe and it's so finely tuned, uh, right. how did it get that way? And that leads to some possible religious explanation. Yes, yes, yes. Either you get stuck with a religious viewpoint, you say that God made these numbers so that life could occur. I always worry that, you know, you didn't do that good a job in a way, because life doesn't seem to be all that common. <laughs> You've got to look enormous distances where there's even a hope of finding another think well life at all in intelligent life goodness knows i mean i don't know how far one has to look right. maybe we're within not even with our galaxy but right. many different arguments about that it seems to be that it's not all that favorable towards life all right so we we have a quantum mechanical multiple universe of you we have uh multiple universes required to explain the fine tuning of this universe and we also have multiple universes generated by inflation theory uh, the consequences of, of inflation theory. That's a little bit like, I suppose, the constants of nature one, but one of the arguments is you have these sort of bubbles. So it's a thing yeah. called eternal inflation or various different terms, right. various slightly different theories, where inflation is argued not to be unique, that, okay, we live in one of them, but if the universe keeps on going and if we have this positive cosmological constant that we seem to have, it'll keep on going forever, ever expanding, and then the chance even though it may be very tiny, for one of these new bubbles to occur, right. uh, at least it happens to occur somewhere. So right. that's the argument. And then they, they get into all sorts of trouble about why we aren't in one of those bubbles <laughs> rather than where we actually are. But even if you have something that is a very, very small chance of occurring, and if you have an infinite amount of time, yes. even that will occur infinitely. That, that, right? That's <laughs> the sort of argument, right. yes, yes. Right. Right. Well, I'm not So happy. what's your view of all these multiple <laughs> universes? I'm afraid I'm not favorably disposed towards any of them particularly the quantum mechanical one, because I think that quantum mechanics needs modification, and these modification will lead to a different view which doesn't involve multiple universes. Okay. Uh, with regard to inflation, I'm not a fan of inflation, so I'm not supportive of those models. I think they run into an awful, awful lot of trouble, internally anyway. Uh, but it's also one of the problems that inflation leads you into. Why were the conditions so special? And the argument goes, well, if they weren't so special here, then they were so special yeah, somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. And it's that kind of argument, and it says that uh, we have to... Well, th that argument has trouble, too. It doesn't really explain why the universe is so big, if you like. Why do you have a little bit of inflation, which caused enough for us, and wasn't enough to produce all those endless galaxies and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. So the difficulties of that sort. Um, 
but I'm not a fan of that idea anyway. Uh, the multiple, the constants of nature one, I regard as the only serious argument. It's the problem I have with that is we really don't know. I mean, there are, for example, I could point to two very good science fiction stories, one by Fred Hoyle, and he was, in a sense, one of the people who, well, the, uh, one of the only real uses, special, fine-tuned nature of the universe, where he predicted a, a level of right. carbon, which hadn't been seen before, and lo and behold, there it was, and it was needed to produce the right amount of carbon, and mm -hmm. so on. So you can argue that that wasn't exactly inflation, it, it wasn't exactly anthropic argument, because uh, you need, we have carbon anyway, even if it didn't have people. <laughs> but nevertheless, that was a strong motivation yes. in that case. I don't know of many arguments where the anthropic argument gets you very far. Uh, with regard to the fine-tuning of the constants, uh, I think, okay, there is a point there, but how big a point it is, I'm not sure. Partly because we haven't the remotest idea what gives rise to, right, rise to life. Yeah. I mean, science fiction story due to Fred Hoyle, uh, where, where he introduced this idea of a black cloud, which <laughs> was a completely different scale right. of things yeah. and nothing like how life evolved on the Earth. I have no idea how, how we could see that evolving, but, but nevertheless, it was an idea of conscious life utterly different from what we've seen. Another science fiction story, which I wrote a really nice one, worked out very, very beautifully, was by Robert Forward, called Dra Dragon's Egg, in which he envisaged life on a neutron star. And here, it's completely different. But the life, basically, was millions, went on millions of times faster than life <laughs> on the Earth. And, and he had a very clever story which related to these completely different time scales. The Chilas, as they lived on this neutron star, and the humans who were orbiting around, and in order to communicate, they had to cope with this extraordinary difference in time scales. So, here and again, you have some completely different idea as to what could produce intelligent life. We just don't know. Uh, I'm, I suppose, um, emotionally favor, favorable, favorably disposed towards the idea that these constants of nature are really mathematical numbers. That they come about through some theory beyond anything we have. They couldn't have been anything else. And this value is tied up somehow with the fact that consciousness has to exist in the world. I have no idea how that might come about, but it's, it's perhaps a slightly different take on, on the anthropic idea.